Well, yesterday, Pastor Steve prophesied about me that it would be uh, an intense message. So because we don't want him to be stoned as a false prophet, <laughs> I'll try to accommodate, okay? <laughs> Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. You know us. You know us, Jesus. You know every one of us. You know those that are here in the chapel and in the cafeteria this morning and those who are watching. You know us, God. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and search us. We invite your presence to search us, O oh God. Lord, that you might change us and conform us to your image, that you might save, O oh God, those who are lost, that you might bring backsliders home. Lord, we just ask for your intervention, your mercy to be poured out in the power of the Holy Ghost to touch lives and to change people. In your precious and wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to share with you the love of God. But you may not understand this as a love of God. It may not have been preached to you as a love of God before. You may not even heard it preached. But I guarantee you what I'm going to be sharing is a love of God. And another thing I can guarantee is I'm not ticked. <laughs> I'm not angry, okay? I may get passionate, but I, I am crying out. I have been crying out for it to be the love of God revealed through my words today. So as the other speakers open, so I will do the same to keep the tradition going. And it doesn't have to go beyond this, of course, so. <laughs> but Luke 17, verses 26 through 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Just as it was in the days of Noah. What defined the days of Noah? Well, we're told in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that every inclination of the heart of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That means that all of humanity, to the point of where the, the ark was lifted up in the waters, to that point, all of humanity, their thoughts were evil all the time. Their heart was evil. And I think it's important that we understand what this is, because it doesn't get in the aspect in this verse and what Jesus says of concentrating upon their violence. And when he brings out the situation of, of Lot, what did he say about them? It would be the same as in the days of Lot. But he said they were doing what? Eating and drinking, marrying, giving to marriage. The same identical thing of what was going on in the days of Noah. What is the evil that Jesus is speaking about? What was the evil that was going on? Because with Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't mention the sexual sins and all the other perversions. What it comes down to be is an evil that is greater than we understand, and because it's so much a part of this fallen world, we don't understand how evil it is. It takes God breaking into our world to help us understand it. And what is that evil? That we can do life without God. It doesn't matter the name of the sin a person practices. It doesn't matter if it's a, some kid in L.A. that's gangbanging or some grandma that's never chewed or smoked in her life. The sin that damns people to hell is the sin of anarchy, the sin that makes people refuse to bow to the rule of God, that there's no room for God in their life. No room for God in their, in their thoughts. No room for God. They may be religious. They may go to church. They will have religious thoughts on Sunday morning and go home, and from the moment on, the rest of the week is just filled with self and all the things that they want. 
That's what it will be before Jesus comes back. The mass of humanity will be consumed with self. The mass of humanity will not be concerned about who this God is or what he does. They may be religious. They may meditate. They may be in this Eastern mysticism. They may be in even a good Bible-believing church, but life is still all about them. No room for God in their life. And the Lord called this evil. He called this evil. And ultimately, this is why he destroyed the world in Noah's day, why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and why he will bring an end to the world as we know it, not that far off. Yet in the midst of all this, the heart of God is revealed. Genesis 6, 6, it says, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. You know what happens we think of God as this impersonal being, that he is infinite, all-powerful, and, and this great God has no emotions. And even as Pastor Steve brought up earlier, it's just not the way it is. God is a person. He is the person of God. There's no other like him. He alone is God, but he is a person, and we were made in his image, and he has given us personhood. He has given us the ability to have emotions, and God has emotions. His, per, his emotions are perfect without fault. There is no error. There is no extreme to any of them. They are full, complete, infinite, and beautiful in every expression. We were given an expression of his emotions, but ours are twisted from the fall and perverted. They are distorted, and so we don't know how to have right emotions, but God's emotions are perfect. He was grieved. He was grieved, and you know what that word means? It's this idea that his heart was filled with pain. Why? Because he loves humanity. He was filled with pain because he created mankind to be one thing, and they rebelled against them. Now, in the wisdom of God, and I don't understand how all this stuff works, but for, for there to be the ability to love, there must be free will. And it began with angels. He gave angels a free will. And don't ask me how it works, because God deals with angels different than he does with people. But they had a free will, and we know that Satan, Lucifer, rebelled and took a certain amount of angels with him that are now devils. A free will, they chose not to love God, chose not to submit. And then Satan took that rebellion that he began and he brought it to Adam and Eve and spread it through them to each of us. He's grieved. He created us to be in fellowship with him and we fight against that. Humanity fights against the very reason they were created. They fight against this commandment to love him. Isn't that insane? This beautiful, wonderful love where he says, love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we say, no, I want to love myself. No, I want to love my own ways, my own sin. No, I refuse to do that. And yet this idea of grieving is not an Old Testament thought alone. It's in the New Testament as well. Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve. You know what that tells me right there? that the Holy Spirit's as much God as the Father and Son. Divinity is revealed in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he grieves over our sin. Don't think that you can practice sin when no one's watching and not have somebody watching that is grieved over the actions that you do and over the heart condition. Don't think that there's such a thing that you can do all by yourself and not bother anybody because if it even, it didn't, even if your sin did not touch another person, it does though. But even if it didn't, it touches God and it grieves the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God. We never think like that, do we? We don't think about it when we give ourselves over to sin, when we have evil thoughts within us or whatever. We don't realize, we don't think about the aspect of a God that's right there, sees what we do, but not just sees what we do, knows what we do because he knows what's inside here and what's in here. He knows. He knows. And those actions, our actions literally break the heart of God.
But sin is so selfish, makes us so, so selfish that we don't care who we hurt when we are in sin. We don't care that we hurt family and friends. We don't care then that we hurt the heart of God. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 22. And as you're turning there, I'll just read verse 22. That's the setting of what's going to go on here. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. What's going on here is this is the final time of Jesus teaching. He's heading to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And as he's going along, he's teaching. That's what he did. He taught. He did miracles. He loved humanity. The love of the Father revealed through God incarnate. Through God incarnate, love. He was loving the people. He was going along, preaching to them the truth. There was nobody more loving than Jesus. The perfect love of God revealed in flesh and blood. And as we begin to look at what goes on here in this setting, we are going to see the love of God. And the love of God spoken as is not even spoken in the majority of churches because too many pastors are cowards and afraid to preach the truth to their people. And so they don't show the love of God to them. They keep the true love and the full love of God from them by giving watered-down messages. The primary focus of this chapter, of this entire chapter, the primary focus is repentance. The most beautiful gift that God has given us outside of Christ because we have repentance because of Jesus. The devil has been so aggressive, so absolutely aggressive of getting the message of repentance out of the church because he knows that when that message is in the church, the church repents and gets right with God. And when they get right with God, then they begin to reach a perishing world. He has effectively gotten that message out of the church where it is not preached from pulpits all across this nation. Few pastors preach that anymore. Few pastors, they're afraid to do it because they'll have rebellion rise up in their church. I can say that because I pastored for 17 years, so I understand the dynamics of pastoring. And so here's Jesus going from town to town. It doesn't tell us where this happened. It just tells us, tells us that when he's on his journey, that someone comes up to him. This is in verse 23. He asks him a question. Lord, are only a few going to be saved? It's a good question, kind of, sort of. I mean, you know, we all, we all want to know it. Is many people going to be saved or just a few? Well, I would venture to say, because of who Jesus was probably speaking to here, this was probably a religious Jew. And so is it just us Jews that are going to be saved? Us who have been circumcised? Are we the only ones that are going to be saved? I mean, is, can it go anywhere else type of thing? And... He asked the wrong question. He should have went and says, am I going to be saved? You see, we can go and say, is other people going to be saved? How many people are going to be saved? And as long as we make it with other people, we don't have to deal with ourselves. That's why some of you that are fighting against your counselors, you are resisting what God is doing. You're on the verge of being kicked out because you refuse to look at yourself. You try to blame shift and take everything off of you and go and blame your counselor, blame this person, everybody else, and as a result, your sin remains. Your sin remains because you are too stubborn, too proud, too rebellious, and you don't want to humble yourselves before God and obtain mercy. You need to ask, Lord, am I going to be saved? That's the question you need to be asking. Am I going to be saved, God? And if you don't ask that question, it doesn't matter what else you do, you are wrong there. You are outside of what you need to be and what you are to be doing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went and told us in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Is this God's heart? He wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to be saved. Jesus didn't die on the cross just for a couple. He made the way that all of humanity could come to salvation. 
He does not want to damn a single person to hell. That is the choice of individuals, and he honors their choice. But this road is wide. I mean, it's, it's an eight-lane, a 20-lane expressway. I mean, just moving fast. Everybody just rushing, rushing to hell, oblivious to the reality of what they're doing, oblivious that this road ends, that it just drops right off. My wife and I were ministering in Montana, and we had a day off, and we went driving around. We found this road that there had been an earthquake in the 70s, and the earthquake had, had made part of the mountain collapse and, and dammed up the river and made a lake that was there, and, and there was a whole campground that was totally buried, so a bunch of people died in it. And the road has, you can travel a part of the road, and all of a sudden, wham, it's gone. I mean, you keep driving, you're off into, into the water. Just right like there, people rushing 100 miles an hour, and there's the cliff, and they refuse to realize what's ahead. And they don't want to take their eyes off of where they're heading to realize there is an exit, and it's a narrow exit, and you get off that exit, and guess what? You've got to get out of your fast car. And then you've got to walk a hard road. And people might get off and look at that and go, uh... Uh, isn't there another message out there? Some other preacher that'll tell me what I want to hear? Let me find a church that will accommodate, that we can agree with each other. And you can find anybody who'll tell you out there what you want to hear. But if you want the truth, that's a whole different thing. Narrows the road. You can't make it one inch wider. He will not alter what the road is. He will not change salvation for anyone not anyone. He has established what it is, and it will not be changed. And if you want salvation, it's either his way or it's no way. You understand it's that serious. You're not talking about a man. You're not talking about somebody that's flawed. You're not talking about somebody that doesn't know everything. We're talking about God who knows absolutely everything. And he said, this is the way, walk in it. It is a narrow road. And if you won't take that narrow road, you will not make heaven your home. It's just that simple. And the choice is yours that you refuse to do it, that you want this fast road to hell, that you want to continue in your sin. You want to do what you want to do because you think it's your right to do what you want to do. And you can do what you want to do. Just be willing to accept the consequences because you'll have no choice over that. Returning back to Luke 13. At the beginning of Luke 13, he does a little bit of teaching here. And what happens is Jesus uses the news, the, the daily news in essence. They didn't move, the news didn't move as fast, so this is common news of the day. So he was using it as a, a platform in the preach. And it says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Are those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Who is he speaking to? The religious Jews. Unless you repent, you will perish. You're not going to get to heaven because you are Jewish, because you, you hold to the Mosaic law. You will, only you will only make heaven your home if you will take the path of repentance. It's the only way it comes. There's no other way. We want to categorize things. We like doing this. People do this all the time. I'm not as bad as them, so I must be a good person. I go to church. I give tithes. I'm a good person. The problem is you need to take this up with God and ask him if you're a good person. And I think you might get an answer that's slightly different. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're not convinced about it, read Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 and tell me what you think at the end, okay? Okay. I mean, if that there doesn't tear you to pieces and show you that every single person is a willful rebel against God, that all their sin is absolutely evil, evil to the core, that there's nothing good inside of anybody when left to themselves, if you're not convinced of that, then you read, need to read it until you are, until you finally let the truth of God's word begin to define your life and you begin to agree with him rather than the lusts of your own flesh. What is repentance? It's not, I'm sorry. 
All kinds of people go to God and say, I'm sorry. But if I walked up to you and punched you in the face and said, I'm sorry, what would you think? Oh, okay, all right, I forgive you. And I punched you again in the face, sorry. <laughs> Do you think after the hundredth time I don't mean what I'm saying? I mean, you get the picture here? You can go to God and punch him in the face again and again and again and again and say every single time, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and still go to hell because you never repented. Until repentance comes in your life, you are a hell-deserving sinner. And so repentance must come in your life. So what is it? Well, it's put in a very wonderful, wonderful way in Acts chapter 11, verse 18. And I don't want to take the time to go in this story, but what's happening here is it's speak, spoken of as repentance unto life. You see, that's what repentance is. You want life? There's only one way to get it. Through Jesus, through the gift of repentance that he offers. No other way. If you'll not take the path of repentance, not live a life of repentance, then you'll move yourself outside of salvation, away from the gift of God and all he wants to give you. In Romans 2.4, it tells us that the goodness or kindness of God leads us to repentance. Not a cruel God, not an angry God, not a bitter God, not a vengeful God, but a kind, loving, good, caring, benevolent God that would break into our world. And we don't understand how radical that is, that God would break into the lives of us rebels, people that were God-haters, people that, that fought against everything he was, everything he stood for, that we lived in absolute rebellion against him, and worse, even worse than that, is how many of you thought you were Christian in the madness and insanity of the evil you practiced? And yet he came to you in his loving kindness, in his tenderness, in his patience. Patience, that's a good thing to be thankful of for God, I'll tell you what. That's a really good thing to be thankful of. Thank you for being patient, O oh God. And that is not that he justifies our sin but that he's actively working in our life to bring us to repentance if we would but have ears to hear. So repentance is sorrow for sin. It's grief for having committed sin, and it's a passionate turning away from sin with abhorrence. Do you understand what I just said there? It's not an I'm sorry. It's that you begin to see how evil your sin is, the evil you perpetrated, that you did against God and his commandments, that you did against people, that you don't see it as a small thing anymore, a mistake. What a shame when that is what the church preaches, that we made a mistake. We didn't make mistakes. We were rebels, deliberate rebels against God, fighting against everything he stood for absolutely evil, and yet he broke in our world to come to us individually to point out the reality of our sin that he might give us opportunity to repent. Repentance produces a holy aggression to right the wrongs that we did. Charles Finney, the great evangelist of the 1800s, preached repentance and an expression of repentance, and I thoroughly believe what he, he taught. An expression of repentance is making restitution whenever possible, that you right the wrongs that you can right. There was an account of revival that he was having. God was just pouring his power out, and this young girl got saved, and, and she was what might be classified by some as a kleptomaniac. She was a sinner that practiced the sin of stealing, okay? That's what it was. Take the label off her. Okay. She gets truly saved and she starts giving back everything she stole. This girl's father hunts down Finney and says, Finney, you've got to come. You've got to talk to my daughter. She's going insane. She's, she's going crazy. Says, I don't know what's wrong with her. And so he comes to the house and here's this girl just in agony, absolute agony. And he says, what's going on? She says, I have given back everything I stole from people, but there's one thing I haven't returned, and I don't know who owns it. It was a Bible she had stolen. She says, I stole this Bible. I don't know who it belongs to, and I don't know how to take care of it. And, and, Cunny, and, and Finney went and, and showed her that repentance does what it can do, that it makes restitution when possible. And so he says, God is forgiven because you don't remember who that is. It doesn't mean he won't forgive you, but you have tried to right the wrongs. How many people today do that? 
How many people strive to right the wrongs in their life? I robbed from people. I'll pay them back. I stole from not paying my rent. I'll pay them back. I didn't pay my bills. I'll pay them back. I hurt people. I'll go to them and repent and cry out for mercy from them. How many times does that happen anymore? And you want to know why it doesn't? Because we are still so proud that we are not willing to humble ourselves in such a way. Stories, I know, so many stories, sad stories. The sins that people practice. The beating of a wife. The man refusing to acknowledge the evil inside of him. You understand? There's no repentance. There's no Christianity there. Christianity comes through repentance and making restitution. Reconciling ourselves to God first and then to others. Repentance is always accompanied by a reliance upon God. It's grace we are saved. It's grace that we stand. It's grace that we walk. It's grace that we make heaven our home. It's grace that we're in heaven forever. All grace. And we become dependent upon the grace of God. Not dependent upon ourselves, but dependent upon grace. Repentance always produces a humble, holy, and loving obedience to God. Where obedience becomes a joy. A joy. Because we find that place of loving him sweeter, better, more fulfilling than anything that could ever come from this world. And I'm not even saying there's a, the ability to make a comparison because this world is as dung, as as filth, as junk. And then you taste the beauty of his holiness and cleanness and purity. And it is so attractive. Now Jesus answers this question that was asked. Will many be saved? How many will be saved? And so he made it very personal. That's what Jesus did. He always brought it to the person. And I'll tell you what, he made people uncomfortable. There's nobody more loving than Jesus, nobody more disturbing. I guarantee you he disturbed you. I guarantee you when he taught, you were wiggling in your seat and you were getting angry at times because he's confronting things. It dealt with the reality. He went after the heart issue, not the head issue. Yes, he dealt with the head and taught truth, but he went after the heart because that's where the problem really is. And until the heart is dealt with, the mind will not want to change. And so Jesus answers the question with a warning. In verse 24, he said, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, I don't want to pick anything about doctrine here. I just want to try and say what's being said here, okay? Just what's being said here. The King James says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. The word there for strive is actually a very strong word. It's a strong word. It's this, it's this idea of great desire. So it's something you want and you're just striving everything within you. You want this. You want eternal life. So you are going to strive with every bit of strength and knowledge to make heaven your home. To walk right with Jesus. To let no place for sin or the world or compromise in. You strive to enter in. But Jesus says many will strive. Some will only try. And those who try won't make it. Go to people out there. The majority ask, do you want to go to hell? How many people are going to tell you they want to go to hell and those who do it are just going to do it to be antagonists? People don't want to go to hell, at least how they think of it, but they don't want heaven. They really don't want heaven. If they understood what heaven is, heaven would be so appalling to them because they are God-haters and by being God-haters, everything about heaven is about God and they would hate heaven. And so here you have casual Christianity. The difference between biblical Christianity is those who are striving to enter and lukewarm Christianity is those who try, just want to. They hope, well, I'll go to church Sunday. I'll put a little money in the offering. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever. I'll do some of the basic things and you know, I'll appease him. You can't appease God. There's no appeasing him. Either you bow to his rule or you rebel. There's no in between. He can't be bribed. He can't be bought. He can't be conned. He can't be manipulated. So either we come in honesty and bow before him or we rebel against him. And I think it is very healthy for us to make a decision there. You know, do away with the obscurities. I mean, just here, it's black and white. Either you serve Jesus or you don't. Either you walk with him or you don't. Either you love him with all of your heart or you don't. Either you are serving him with everything that's within you or you are not. There's no gray area. It's not there. 
That is the creation of men, not the creation of God. That's what we do so we can live compromised lives of sin in rebellion against God and still think we're okay. Now what Jesus does next, he gives a parable. And this is really where I'm trying to go and how this will tie in to the days of Noah. In verse 25, he says, Once the owner of a house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. So once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, what is going on here? You see, the door was open to the master's house. The door was open, wide open. And it was wide open all day long. All day long, people could come in and they could spend time with the master. They could eat at his table. They could enjoy his presence. The door was wide open. A welcome, a friendship, a camaraderie that was there between those who would come and sit at his table. But the time came. The night fell. And the door was closed. And no more welcome. You see, that's the seriousness of this, that there's a day the door will be closed, and when it's closed, you can't open it. You can't kick it down. You can't force it open. When the door's closed, it's closed, and there's nothing that will change, and you will not, if you stay in that condition, you will not even want it open because your life will be so set in rebellion against God that it would be more hateful to you to be in heaven than to be in hell forever. Hell will be a mercy for those who are God-haters. so that they won't have to dwell in the presence of a holy God that they have hated in this world. Do you understand? And so the door is open. We can know the excellency of Christ's love, know the tenderness of his grace, know this fellowship with God, and this absolutely boggles my mind. Why in the world did he open that door to me? What do I have to offer him? What, what is there in fellowship that I can, can give? And yet that's what he wants. And so the door's open, and the call is there. Come in, all you who are simple. Come in. Leave the insanity of your life. Come in. The greatest privilege, the greatest treasure given to the human race is the gift of unbroken fellowship with God. It's what heaven is all about. It's what we are to taste of right now. Right now. Like David shared Friday night that it's the kingdom of God within us. God comes so close that he dwells in a real and tangible way inside of us. He tells them, says, you will stand outside the door knocking and pleading. They will, they, they, the door's closed with them, and now they're going to beat on the door. They're going to beat on the door, pleading to get in, thinking that they have a right, that they have a right to get in, but yet they refuse to acknowledge the master. They refuse to enter in to the door the way that he said. They wanted the wide road of destruction to lead to heaven, but it never will. And they're outside, knocking and pleading. Open up to me, Open! Didn't you say if I knock, you'll open? But there's a whole different thing. The knocking is for those who really want salvation, for those who are in salvation. And he opens to them. But the knocking to those who are rebels, who do not want him, do not want his salvation, they will stand outside knocking and pleading. Jesus said in Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah. We've read this and heard this again and again. And so it will be now. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. I told you to build this ark. I told you to stock it with all the goods needed for the animals. I brought you the animals, and you brought them onto the ark. Now you get in, because this was all about you finding my ark of salvation. You enter in. You go in, because you have found my favor because you walked in righteousness before me. What does it mean that he walked in righteousness? Well, in the fifth verse of Genesis 7, it says, And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. 
Now, there's something very important here we got to understand. He was obeying God. But where does obedience begin? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? That hadn't been given to mankind yet, but I guarantee you that no one knew what that meant. Obedience can only be obedience when love is the motive behind it. You can go to a child and tell the child to take the trash out, and the child can fuss and argue and make all kinds of excuses and rant and rave and then finally take the trash out. That child was not obedient. That child was a rebel from beginning to end. It just was that you had the authority to force that child to obey you. There was no willful, loving obedience. Because for obedience to be obedience, it must be love. And so Noah loved God. And because he loved the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength, he obeyed the Lord. As what we were told yesterday afternoon, with radical obedience. Radical obedience which it's really not radical. It's only radical in this world because there's so, so much rebels. It is normal Christianity. It is the biblical faith to obey him in everything. And so you have the situation where the door of the ark is open. It's an open door. In the parable Jesus gives, there's an open door. The open door is an invitation, a divine invitation. Come in. Come into the ark. Come into my presence. Come into this place to know me, to know my love, to know my protection. Flee from the wrath of God. And there's only one place to flee from the wrath of God, and that is into the loving arms of Jesus. It's the only place there's refuge from the, from the wrath that is going to be poured out. There is no other place of protection. And so the door is open. The godly are rescued in one of two ways in the days of Noah. When you look at the history of Noah, it goes way back to Adam, to Seth. And then it goes, you can travel it from Seth, eventually coming to Enoch. Enoch, the man that walked with God and the first expression of rapture we have in the, in the book, in the word of God. Taken out of here because he was so pleasing to the, to the father that he says, Enoch, come on home. And he gave birth to Methuselah. Methuselah to Lamech. And Lamech to Noah. A godly legacy, a family of righteous, holy people. Passing on from one generation to the next. And so what do you have here? You have a man that grew up in a righteous, godly home and there was only two ways that they could be rescued. They either had to die or they had to go on that ark. Methuselah and Lamech died shortly before the flood. We're not told about anybody else, the rest of the family. We have no idea. But I would venture to say that all those that were righteous that didn't end up on the ark died and were taken home. You see, that door is an open door of invitation to each of us to come and to enter in, to know our God, to know him. Not just intellectually, but relationally. That's what he really wants, is that relational fellowship, that relational knowledge. And so an open door was also open, not just for the righteous to enter, but for the wicked to enter. Think of that, an open door. The wicked, come in, come into this ark. And I just imagine in my mind's eye as Noah's building this ark, the mockery that's going on and all the other stuff, that the harassment that he's having, but as the thing is finished, it's all finished, it's done. Now they're standing around it and they're looking and they're gazing and they're mocking at him and he's standing in the door and he's preaching to them. And then all of a sudden the animals start coming because God brought the animals supernaturally. They start coming and Noah and the family bring them onto the ark and put them in their proper places. And the people are scratching their heads and says, what's going on? Why are these animals coming? What's happening? And they still mocked and mocked and mocked. And I can just imagine that after they were on the ark, all the animals and Noah's on the ark, we're told seven days that door was open. Seven days, an invitation for the world to come, to enter into the ark. Seven days, and I can imagine Noah standing in the door of the ark, pleading with the people that were throwing stones at him and mocking him, appealing to them, come, there's a refuge. 
Just imagine. Just think of this. On that seventh day, when he is pleading with them once again, and all of a sudden, supernaturally, the hand of God closes the door. And the people there, just with mouths gaping open, uh, stunned by it. And then they start going, (laughs) what kind of trick is this? Yeah, just a trick. He's trying to freak us out, that's all. And then the first drop started to fall. It's too late. The door was closed. Too late. Too late. As it was in the days of Noah and Lot, so will it be the days of the second coming. There will be a time when the door is closed. It's done. It's finished. And if you don't live to the point to see that, you will personally have a day where your door is closed. And it's going to come in one of two ways. It's either going to be that you die in your sin, and the moment you breathe your last, that door is closed, slammed in your face, no hope of repentance, no hope of turning. Your religion isn't going to save you. The other way is that you become so persistent in sin where God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And he says, it's done. And imagine, I want to, I want it, I want to terrify you. Imagine you leave pure life. You leave because you refuse to repent of your sin. And imagine that you end up in some church. And maybe you're a nice guy for the rest of your life or whatever, but be terrified if the door is closed, never to be called again, never to be given another opportunity. You don't know when that will happen. We are told that, that it's the Father that draws and no man can come to the Son except he be drawn. What if that is withheld from you? You think you can practice sin. You think you can practice it and go on and on and on and never think that there's the closing of the door just like it was in the days of Noah, just like it was in the days of Lot. Terrible situation. You know, saddest of all, the saddest of all. Just imagine that there were some people that went onto the ark, walked onto the ark at the pleading of Noah, they walk on. There they are in the ark. They enter in that place of salvation. They cry out to God, and God forgives them. But then instead of going in deeper, they look at, out the door, and they see the mocking, and they see the, the, the perversion. They see the evil that they're doing, and, it's, and their heart becomes like Lot's wife that longs and looks back. And to leave the safety of the ark to go back into the world. Pastor Steve read a verse exactly on that when he was up here, exactly on that. You can have all the doctrines you want. It's a matter of what the word teaches. If you are going to have fear in your life, have the fear the day that door is slammed in your face, that you are outside of salvation, that there's no hope, that it is done. That's why we are told today is the day of salvation. Today is it. What's the response of the wicked to what Jesus is saying? He ends, up, he ends up giving their response. He says, then you will say, we ate and drunk with you and talked in your streets. We have a right to heaven. We're religious, aren't we? We're of the right denomination. I was baptized as a baby. I was baptized as an adult. All the right stuff. Didn't I do the good? Look at how much money I gave. I have a right to heaven. But that's not how people get in heaven. You see, it's that gift of repentance. It's that gift of repentance. This beautiful, wonderful gift of repentance that the mercy of God brings to us and invites us to turn from our sin. And we don't understand how great that gift is. How great is the gift that he would take our sins and remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. How great is that gift? And 
So then in verse 27, but the man inside, the master will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evil doers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. I mean, this here had to get so many people angry. There's so much you don't have time to get into. But he's saying, okay, you're going to see Abraham and them in there, and you're cast out. You're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is not pain. you got to understand, that's not pain. The weeping and gnashing of teeth is about rage, about anger. They are angry. Why are they in there? And I'm not. I deserve to be in heaven. Anger forever at God in hell. Rage and never yet willing to look at themselves just like people won't do today. Those who get themselves in, in the character trait of focus upon themselves, that they're good, that they're okay, and only looking at the faults of everybody else, they will do that throughout eternity. Blame God forever, gnash their teeth at him in rage and anger because they didn't want to receive the gift of repentance to stop looking at everybody else and begin to look in the mirror and see how ugly and evil the sin is that we have practiced. He made the statement in verse 27, I don't know you or where you come from. And he made that already prior in verse 25. So he brings this thought out twice. I don't know you. I don't know you. You know the common thing that people end up saying? They're saying, well, these people were never saved in the first place. Well, there's no biblical basis for that, though. You know what Jesus is doing? He's quoting the book of Ezekiel. This comes out in Ezekiel chapter 3, chapter 18, and chapter 33. It comes out strong, it comes out bold, it comes out clear. I'll read to you one verse out of chapter 18. But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty of and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. You can't rely upon the sinner's prayer to get you to heaven. You can't rely on what you once were. It's a matter of when the flood comes, in essence, whether you're on the ark or you're not on it. That's how serious it is. That's what it's all about. It's not about what you once were. It's about what you are. That the kingdom of God is inside of you. That this relationship with God, this unbroken fellowship, is the, is the goal of your life, and you are pressing towards that. It's the desire of your heart and you want to see it fulfilled finally, completely, and absolutely when you are with Jesus. Now unbroken fellowship forever and ever and ever and ever. And the joy of that fellowship, the wonder, the bliss, the beauty of it, and we can't even imagine it because we're told in Ephesians that his love surpasses the knowledge of human understanding. The wonder of this God, of what he offers us. And then we heard him again and again and again and again. There's that season of an open door, the welcome of God, the pleading. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. The pleading, the pleading heart of God, pleading with us. And you know what? He doesn't have to do that. It, but it's the nature of God. I'm glad that's his nature. But it's his nature. He wants us. He wants us enough that he will plead with us. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, is a, and that, that portion of Scripture is a prophecy about the New Testament church, and this is specifically about Jesus and the New Testament church. So it has this prophecy contain, contains both a prophecy of Christ and a prophecy of the church, but the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news of the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vengeance of our God. Jesus read this in Luke chapter 4 and says, I'm the fulfillment of it. But the church is a fulfillment of it as well, a secondary uh, a fulfillment of this prophecy. The year of the Lord's favor, a season of favor, the door is open. The invitation is out. Come, come. Any of you that are watching this, the invitation's out. Come, come. Come, the door's open. Come, enter in. Now's the day of salvation. Now's the time. 
I will forgive your sins. I will wash them away. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will give you a new beginning. Come. The door's open. Why do you, re- why do you hold back? Why do you stay away? Why do you resist? Why do you fight such love? But if we reject the year of the Lord's favor, there is a day of vengeance. A day where the door is closed. When that day is closed, when that door is closed, when that day comes, it is final. There is no, post, no such thing as post-mortem conversion where there's salvation out of death. There is no such thing as purgatory. It's not in the Bible. You can't burn off your sins. It is forever. And it is the justice of God to do that. And we need to understand a little bit of what sin is all about. God is holy. He is absolutely holy. The essential nature of God is not love. John says that God is love, and it's an aspect of a quality, a character trait of God. But the essential nature of God is holiness. Because he is holy, what he created was good and holy. And after he created everything, he went and says, it is good, or the Hebrew is tov. It is good, I'm well pleased with what I did. And then he created man, then he says, I am very well pleased. Made creation holy, a place where he would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And then Satan rebelled, and Adam and Eve rebelled. And a spiritual COVID-19 came into the world. You see, sin is a choice, but it is this evil disease that's gotten into God's creation. And God must do something about this corruption of his good creation. He must To not do something would be totally contrary to who he is as God and who he is as holy. He must deal with sin. He must confront it. And there will be one day where sin will be dealt with. It will be destroyed. Hell will will be cast in the lake of fire. And the lake of fire cast away forever in an eternal quarantine. And then a new heaven and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Sin fully eradicated out of his new creation. You see, sin only has a little bit of time here. That's all. It only has a little bit of time. It is going to be fully dealt with. It will be dealt with. There's no way that God cannot deal with it. He is dealing with it now, and he will deal with it, and he will give it a final blow. It will be finally cured from his creation. And so the the door is open for you now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to run home to Jesus. You're going to run into his arms. You're going to see the door open and run as fast as you can into that door and come sliding at his feet, weeping in agony over your sin, taking true repentance, the cry for deliverance in your life, to never go back to the filth of what you were, whatever names may be behind it. Because you want him. You want him. And that's really where he wants to take us. When I first came to Christ, I was a young man strung out on drugs. I was a hippie during the hippie movement. And, and uh, I didn't come to Jesus out of noble reasons. I can't even tell you why. I, all I know that that God tugged on one thing in my life. And it was this thing that is in all of us. And he uses it all the time. It's loneliness. This loneliness was inside of me. No matter what parties I was in, no matter what I was doing, this ache, I couldn't put it to words. I didn't know. I couldn't understand. And yet here's this God pulling upon that, pulling upon this ache until finally in a park where I used to party and deal drugs, he broke in my world. When I wasn't asking, when I wasn't looking, he wanted me. And he's tugging on your heart to bring you home. It was after salvation started working in my life that I found the joy of loving him. You see, you can't begin by loving him, but if you will come, you will love him. If you know this Jesus and you want to know him more, you will know him then. 
And you will know that there's nobody more loving and beautiful and wonderful and kind and gentle than him. You will taste of the wonder of that love and be moved and compelled and want to be fully, completely defined by it. Your life defined by it. Your marriage defined by it. Your children defined by it. You want to see it spread through this world because you see it is good. It is contrary, absolutely, 100% hostile to this world and the evil and all that it stands for. He wants to define us fully and completely by that. But if you are not right with Jesus, fear the day that that door is closed on you. And you know what we need to do? Make sure that never happens. Going back to Ezekiel 3 and 18 and 33, you know one of the things why, why God gave the prophet that message three times? Part of it was he says, I want you to go and I want you to warn the wicked that they would repent. And I want, you to, I want you to warn the righteous so they repent. He wanted the righteous to stay righteous, so he called them. He reproved them. He corrected them because he wanted the righteous to stay in the ark. He wanted the righteous to be faithful to the end. He wanted the righteous to get as far away from that door into the ark as possible, not to be sitting in the door looking at the world, longing for the world but to get so far in because you love being with Jesus and you want to be with him and your heart aches for him, so you press in more and more. He reproves the righteous so the righteous stay righteous because he knows we all have wandering hearts. We all have wandering hearts, terrible things, terrible things they are, but yet his love is greater and he can conquer those wandering hearts if we would but let him. Father, we come before you now in the precious name of Jesus. And Lord, you know everyone that has heard this message. The students, Lord, those who have been watching online and through their phones, Lord, you know, you know them, oh God. You know their spiritual condition. God, please, I cry to you, don't let them believe lies about themselves right now. Help them to see the truth of their spiritual condition. Those who are, who are not right with you, God, let them come to grips with the reality of that, that they might make a choice. And I pray, God, it's the right choice to run home to you. Lord, I'm also asking for those who are righteous, those who are walking with you to hear the message and say, God, I want to be so near to you. These are dangerous times, God. These are dangerous times. A great falling away is upon us, O oh Lord. Now is the time for us as Christians to press in deeper, to have a greater passion, to strive with all that's within us to enter into the kingdom of God and to stay in that kingdom. Lord, you are worth the pursuit. You are worth it all. This world is just dung. It's just dung. It's worse than that, oh God. And the treasures you give of yourself to us is richer than we could ever fathom, oh Lord. It's found in that place of pursuing you. And the joy of the pursuit, the wonder of the pursuit, oh God. And I'm asking for people to truly come to salvation. To truly come to repentance, oh God. Not worldly sorrow that just says, I'm sorry, but godly repentance that brings a radical transformation of the heart and mind. Lord, that they leave the world and they enter into the ark of yourself, the ark of your presence, the ark where we know you and find you and find you more beautiful than we could imagine, where our eyes are opened up and we see things that the world can't even fathom, oh God. Jesus.